Hi everyone, today we will start chapter 6, which is on alkyl halides and substitution reactions. So we just finished our, uh, our chapter on alkanes, I guess a couple chapters ago, and remember an alkane is a, an, a molecule that has sp3 hybridized carbons, and the only elements, the only atoms, are carbons and hydrogens. So if we have all single bonds and just carbon and hydrogen, we call that an alkane. If there's a double bond with just carbon and hydrogen, we'd call it an alkene. And if there's a triple bond, we call that an alkyne. So when we add halogens to alkanes, we get what are called alkyl halides. So the alkyl part of that refers to the alkane, and the halide part refers to the halogen. So notice that on that the first uh, group here, these are alkyl halides because there are only single bonds in these molecules. And besides the carbon and hydrogen, we just have different halogens like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Uh, it's possible, of course, to have halogens in other molecules too. So if we have a halogen that's bonded to an sp2 hybridized carbon, um, we can get what's called a vinyl halide. So a vinyl halide is just that halogen. Notice that it's bonded to the, a carbon that is participating in a double bond with another carbon. Um, and we can have a, a different kind of ha halide where the halogen is also bonded to an sp2 hybridized carbon, but it's a, um, a member of a, an aromatic ring, in this case, a benzene ring. So in this chapter, we're only going to focus on alkyl halides where all of the bonds are single bonds, and those are derived from alkanes, hence alkyl, uh, we're not going to see vinyl halides or aryl halides on here, but I wanted to point these out because we're going to start talking about some reactions that alkyl halides participate in, and vinyl halides and aryl halides do not participate in these same reactions. So to in order for a molecule to undergo the kind of substitution reactions that we're going to look at in this chapter, they must be alkyl halides. So they, that halogen must be bonded to an sp3 hybridized carbon. So alkyl halides um, are those that are derived from alkanes. Notice uh, we have chloromethane here, and if, that was, if the chlorine was replaced by an H, then we would just call that methane. So putting the, the chlorine atom on there makes this an alkyl halide. And alkyl halides are different than alkanes because that halogen uh, is generally an electronegative group, and that electronegative group pulls some of the electron density away from the carbon. So alkanes, are gen with just carbon and hydrogen, we say those are nonpolar because carbon and hydrogen have very similar electronegativity, and so they share the electrons evenly. We don't have any dipole moments, and we don't have any posit partial positive or partial negative charges when we look at alkanes. But when we add a halogen atom, we replace one of the H's with a halogen atom, like in chloromethane, now we've added a dipole moment. This molecule becomes polar. That chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so it pulls some of the electron density away from the carbon, which gives the, the halogen a partial negative charge, and it leaves the carbon that it's attached to with a partial positive charge. So we can represent this with uh, a dipole moment, as seen in the top image, or we can represent this with an electrostatic potential map, as seen in the bottom image. So remember, in the electrostatic potential map, uh, red indicates uh, high electron density, and the blue colors indicate low electron density. So we can see in the EPM of chloromethane that the electrons are not shared evenly, and that most of the electron density on that molecule is in fact on the chlorine, like we would expect because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. Um, the halogens differ in their electronegativity, of course. The fluorine is the most electronegative halogen. It's also the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. Uh, chlorine is less electronegative, but bigger. Bromine is even less electronegative and even bigger. And iodine is the least electronegative, but the biggest. So you can kind of get some visual indication here in this image of the relative size of the atoms. Notice that a fluorine atom is about equal in size to a, a hydrogen. 
So fluorines and hydrogens are pretty similarly sized, but as we go down the periodic table, those atoms get larger and larger. So we just finished our chapter, uh, chapter four, where we were looking at the free radical chain reaction. And we saw that that was employed uh, in, a, in a free radical halogenation, where we can start with an alkane and we can replace one of the H's on the alkane with a halogen atom. So this is how we synthesize alkyl halides. This is one way to synthesize alkyl halides, is to start with an alkane and add a halogen. So we saw um, this is possible with chlorination. So if we start with cyclohexane, for example, we can use uh, molecular chlorine and light to homolytically cleave that bond between the chlorine atoms, and that generates two radicals, and then one of those radicals can replace an H. So this is called a free radical halogenation, and notice that it's also a substitution because the, one of the H atoms on the alkane was substituted with a chlorine atom. Um, what we said about chlorination was that it's not particularly selective, so it's usually not very synthetically useful when we're trying to make molecules. We usually don't want to use um, chlorine because it's difficult to predict where it's going to end up on a molecule, and in fact, it often ends up on lots of different carbon atoms in the molecule, so we usually get a large mixture of products. Uh, one place where we can use it, though, is, for example, on a molecule like cyclohexane, where every single carbon is exactly the same as every single carbon. All six carbons on that molecule are the same. So chlorine is just going to, it doesn't matter which of, of the carbon atoms it reacts with, it's always going to replace one of the hydrogens and give us a chlorocyclohexane. So what we didn't talk about a lot in the last chapter, and we don't, we're not really going to go into it, but of course it's possible that more than one chlorine atom is going to add to cyclohexane. So here we have one chlorine atom, so we call it chlorocyclohexane, but one of the reasons why we only get 50% product in this reaction, even though there's only one type of carbon, is because it's possible that chlorine is going to add to more than one carbon. So we might get dichlorocyclohexane. And in fact, we'll get a large number of those because we could get 1,2-dichloro, 1,3-dichloro, 1,4-dichloro, and so on, and potentially even have more chlorine atoms reacting with the cyclohexane. So uh, using, using chlorine is possible in some cases, but still not particularly, not as useful as bromine. So if we look at the bottom example, we start with a molecule of isobutane, and notice in isobutane we have two different kinds of carbon atoms. We have the primary carbon atoms that are the methyl groups, the CH3 groups, those are primary, and the carbon in the middle that has those three methyl groups attached to it, we would uh, represent that, we would indicate that that's a tertiary carbon. And so remember, bromine is selective, and bromine is going to react with the most substituted carbon first and to the largest extent because it happens the fastest. That, that um, transition state has the lowest activation energy and so we generally just replace the H that's on the most substituted carbon when we do a bromination. So in this case that central carbon being tertiary is going to uh, uh, create the most stable transition state, a tertiary radical, and so we see that that hydrogen on the tertiary carbon has been replaced by a bromine and that we get a 90% product there. So this is just to say that we have seen how alkyl halides are synthesized at least one way. We can use this free radical halogenation with chlorine and, and or bromine, bromine being the more useful because bromine is more selective. Uh, we also saw in that chapter, chapter four, that if we create a radical that's next to a double bond, then we can have resonance. And so we saw this a bit with this molecule here that's called um, allylic, that, uh, and we also saw that a bit with um, with aromatic groups. If we have uh, um, we create a radical that's on a methyl group attached to an aromatic ring, we can get four resonance structures as that radical has resonance within the aromatic ring. So this this molecule on the top is. Um, when we have a carbon, an sp3 hybridized carbon that's right next to a double bond, we call that an allylic position. 
So that carbon here, notice that one of the H's has been removed, and then we generate what's called an allylic radical. So the uh, radical is on that primary carbon now, but because it's right next to a double bond, there's some resonance. And so the, we can homolytically break that double bond and create another double bond on the right side, which leaves us with a radical on the primary carbon on the left. So this makes that primary carbon more stable, the, the radical that's generated from that primary carbon is more stable than we would otherwise expect for a, a primary because resonance stabilizes uh, intermediates because it spreads that charge out. So um, if we look at cyclohexene on the bottom, we notice that there are two carbon atoms, two sp3 carbon atoms that are right next to a double bond, one on the top and one on the bottom. We would call those allylic positions. So the other two uh, carbon atoms that are directly involved in the double bond, those are vinyl carbons, like we saw in that first image where we were looking at vinyl halides. So we have vinyl halides on the double bond, allylic positions on the top and the bottom that are right next to the double bond, and alkyl positions that are uh, on the left side of that molecule that are just alkanes. They're sp3 hybridized carbons that are not next to a double bond, so those are just alkyl positions. So those allylic positions are particularly stable. So if we're going to brominate this molecule, you might say, well, okay, those allylic positions on the top and the bottom, those are secondary. But the alkyl positions that are on the left side of that ring are also secondary because they're also bonded to two carbons. So wouldn't we put a bromine on the allylic position and equally put a bromine on the alkyl position, that's not the case because remember those allylic positions generate radicals that have resonance and therefore those radicals are more stable than we would otherwise expect. So in this case, notice that we get 80% of uh, bromination at that allylic position because the allylic position is more stable than the alkyl position. Uh, a reagent that we haven't seen yet is called NBS, N-bromosuccinamide. And we've got the uh, structure there on the top. It's a, a five-membered ring with a nitrogen that's next to two carbonyls. It's kind of sandwiched in between two carbonyls there. And attached to the nitrogen is a bromine atom. So NBS is a very useful reagent for performing allylic brominations. Uh, when we have... We haven't actually seen this yet, but Br2 can also react with double bonds. So if we have an allylic molecule like the one in the blue box there, there are two places that Br2 could potentially react. Br2 could add to the double bond, and Br2 could have a, undergo free radical halogenation and add to the sp3 hybridized carbon. So if, if what we're after in this reaction is only putting a bromine on the sp3 hybridized carbon, then we would want to keep the concentration of Br2 low. Because if we have too much Br2 in the reaction, it's gonna react with that double bond, and that's not necessarily what we want. The double bond provides stability in that allylic position, so it's gonna make it easier for us to brominate that allylic position, but we don't want to react the double bond as well. So NBS is a good uh, reagent for that because as you can see in that top reaction there, when NBS reacts with HBr, it actually creates a little bit of Br2. So what that means is that we can have, we can add NBS to a reaction and not have too much Br2 in the reaction. It just regenerates a low concentration of Br2. So the takeaway point here is that NBS is a good reagent for allylic bromination. When we have an allylic position, we can either use Br2 or we can use NBS. And NBS is usually a better choice because then we can prevent that double bond from reacting. Okay, so now we have identified what alkyl halides are. They're halogens that are bonded to alkyl positions or alkanes, uh, we have looked at how we can react, or excuse me, how we can synthesize these alkyl halides by using free radical halogenation with Cl2 
or BR2 or even NBS. And now what we're going to focus on for the rest of this chapter are uh, the reactions that alkyl halides can undergo. And specifically, we're going to look at substitution reactions. So um, we have seen this in chapter four. We looked at different kinds of reactions. And so we looked at substitution reactions and notice that a general substitution reaction as the one seen in top here where we have um, an alkyl halide on the right with that X. X stands for halogen. X could be F or CL or BR or I. In general, when you see an X in a molecule, that's uh, a shorthand for some halogen atom. So in this case, we have an alkyl halide with some halogen atom. We call that the substrate. And we have a nucleophile. And remember, nucleophile means nucleus loving. And a nucleus is has a positive charge. So a nucleophile generally has a negative charge, or at least it has a pair of electrons that it can donate to an electrophile. So in this case, in a general nucleophilic substitution reaction, what happens is that nucleophile donates its electrons to the substrate, the electrophile in this case, and it replaces the X, it replaces the halogen. So we call that halogen, notice on the, the right side, the X has been, has been removed from the molecule, and we call it the leaving group, because in this reaction, it leaves, right? So we have a nucleophile as a reagent that kind of reacts with that substrate, and it kicks out the X, so the X is the leaving group. This is the general uh, pattern that we see when we look at nucleophilic substitution reactions. The nucleophile replaces the leaving group. So a specific example where we can actually write some real atoms in there instead of generic variables the, um, of one particular nucleophile is a hydroxide. And so hydroxide OH minus, we've seen that in gen chem often as it's been used as a base. And here we can use that OH minus, that hydroxide ion as a nucleophile. And so uh, it has a pair of electrons that it can donate to an electrophile, and we see that what happens is that it reacts with that substrate, the alkyl halide, in this case iodomethane, and the nucleophile displaces the leaving group, and it, and it kicks it off of the substrate, and it replaces it. So we have, uh, we have generated methanol on the other side, which is just what we get when we put an OH group on that methyl group there, we get a methanol molecule, and the I has left the molecule. It's become the leaving group. Notice that when the I leaves the molecule, it takes the pair of electrons in that carbon-halogen bond with it. So on the left side, iodine only has three lone pairs, but on the right side, that iodide has four lone pairs. Where did the extra pair of electrons come from? It came from the electrons that were within that carbon iodine bond. The iodine takes the electrons with it. And that makes sense because the hydroxide is bringing its own electrons. So we want carbon wants to have eight electrons in the octet rule. And so if iodine is going to take two away, that would leave it with six electrons. And so the hydroxide donates two, which brings it back to eight. So this is the general form of a nucleophilic substitution reaction. There are actually two different ways that these substitution reactions can unfold. One of them is called SN2, and the other is called SN1. We're going to focus on SN2 first because it's actually the simpler of the two mechanisms. And so just as you'd expect, what happens in this mechanism, remember a mechanism is where we draw these curly arrows, and the curly arrows show how the electrons are moving. So it's just how I explained in the last slide. The hydroxide donates a pair of electrons to the substrate, and that's indicated with that pink curly arrow from a pair of electrons on the hydroxide to the carbon atom in the substrate. And the iodine takes the electrons in that carbon iodine bond with it. And so that's indicated by that second curly pink arrow that shows the electrons starting in that CI bond, and the arrow points to the I because the I is taking those electrons with it. So um, in between, we have that transition state. And remember, the transition state is kind of halfway in between reactant and product. 
and in this case the transition state shows that the nucleophile is partially bonded to the substrate and the leaving group is partially bonded to the substrate as it leaves. So this is not a stable structure because this structure if we count the electrons on carbon and we look at those dotted bonds as being two electrons each, then carbon has 10 electrons. It's making five bonds. So that's why those are partial bonds in this case. The OC bond is partially formed and the CI bond is partially broken in the transition state. It's kind of halfway in between reactant and product. Um, another thing to notice here is that that what the halogen does to that substrate is it um, the, the halogen takes some of the electron density away from the carbon and that's represented here as that partial minus and the partial plus that's a polar bond so because it's a polar bond that means that that carbon atom has a partial positive charge on it and that partial positive charge can attract the electrons from the nucleophile plus and minus are attracted so in this case, the minus on the nucleophile is attracted to the plus on the carbon. It kind of pulls them together. And so the um, OH donates its electrons to that partial positive carbon, which kicks the iodine off on the other side. The reason that we call this SN2 is because of the kinetics. And so remember, we talked a bit about rate law in the chapter four, and you talked probably fairly extensively about rate law in Gen Chem. And so the rate law is just, uh, we look at the, the reactants that are involved in the slowest step of a reaction, and we look at the order of those reactants. So in this case, there's only one step in an SN2 mechanism. Both of those arrows are happening simultaneously. So the, o car the oxygen carbon bond is being formed at exactly the same time that the carbon iodine bond is being broken. Hence, we get that transition state where the OH is partially attached and the I is partially removed. So since there's only one step in this mechanism, it is the slowest step. It's the rate determining step. So what we do when we have found the rate determining step, we determine how many reagents are involved in that rate determining step. And in this case, there are two reagents involved, the nucleophile and the substrate. So the concentration of both of those reagents is important to, uh, to uh, determine the rate of the whole reaction. If I have a low concentration of substrate, the reaction is going to go slower. If I have a low concentration of nucleophile, the reaction is going to go slower. And that's because both of those reagents, nucleophile and substrate, are both involved in that one step. So we need to have a high concentration of both of them if we want the reaction to proceed at a fast rate. So because there are two reagents in the rate determining step of this mechanism, we call it second order, right? We can say that the, the substrate uh, doesn't have an exponent in that rate law down there, or if it does have an exponent, the exponent is one. And the hydroxide also has an exponent of one. So the overall order of this reaction is one plus one. The overall reaction, the excuse me, the overall order is two. That, that's first order in methyl iodide and it's first order in hydroxide. So one plus one equals two. So this is a second order reaction. So that's why we call it SN2. That stands for nucleophilic substitution second order. That's where the name comes from. Uh, here is a reaction coordinate diagram for an SN2 reaction for this one that we've been looking at. Um, we start with reactants at a certain energy level. We have our hydroxide and our methyl iodide as reactants on the left side. We have to overcome the activation energy of this mechanism, and that's because that transition state is particularly unstable, and that's because it has five bonds. And so that the reason that we have to go up in energy is because we have to, that transition state is less stable than reactants or products. So that's the nature of this activation energy is bringing that OH minus into, in close to this carbon atom so that we can generate this partially, partially bonded transition state. 
So that's the, the nature of the rate determining step here. And in that transition state, we have two different molecules, the methyl iodide and the hydroxide, which makes this a second order reaction. And the products on the other side are generally more stable than the reactants. So this is an exothermic transition. And that we're going to talk a bit about how we can predict whether the reaction is going to go forward or backwards, whether it's an exothermic or an endothermic reaction, which is based mostly on the reactivity of the nucleophile and the stability of the leaving group. If we have a leaving group that is can leave with those electrons and it's particularly stable, then that's going to make the product side particularly low in energy. In this example, iodine is the leaving group, making an iodide uh, anion, and that is a particularly stable ion because it's so large, it has low charge density. There's a large surface area for the charge to spread out on that iodide ion, which makes it particularly stable. We've talked about this before, actually. Remember when we were talking about acids and bases, uh, and we said the acidity of the halogen acids increases as we go down the periodic table. So HF is the least acidic halogen acid. HCl is a little more acidic. HBr is a little more acidic. And HI is the most acidic. And remember, the way that we justified that was by looking at the size of the ions. So as those F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, I minus, as those ions get larger and larger and larger as they make their way toward iodine, they have more surface area to spread out that charge, which makes the charge density lower, which makes that ion more stable. So I minus is the most stable of the halogen anions because it's the largest. So we can get some qualitative understanding of where these energy lines in the reactants and the products are going to lie based on the stability of our leaving group. When we have stable leaving groups, that's a favorable situation. And so it's going to be an exothermic reaction, and it's going to spontaneously move forward. If we have an unstable leaving group, then that's going to make the products higher in energy, and that's going to be an unfavorable reaction. And so that will not spontaneously occur. So we can imagine looking at it in the opposite direction. If I take I minus and I react it with methanol, and we're kind of looking at this in reverse now, I would kick the OH minus off. Well, OH minus is not as stable as I minus, so we see that that line is higher in energy than the side that has the I minus as the leaving group. If OH minus is my leaving group, that's a high energy situation because OH minus is not as stable. If I minus is my leaving group, that's a low energy situation because I minus is particularly stable. So this is um, a list of the kinds of molecules that we can make with this nucleophilic substitution reaction, which the list is fairly large. We can make lots of different functional groups starting from an alkyl halide. So notice on the left side of this figure, all of my substrates are, contain an R, which is the alkyl group, and an X, which is the halogen. So there, we are always starting from an alkyl halide, and the reason is because halogens are good leaving groups for the most part. F- minus is not so great, we'll talk about that in a minute, but Cl-, minus, Br- minus, and I- minus are good leaving groups. So starting with a halogen on an alkyl group is, makes a good leaving group, makes a good substrate, so we can react that alkyl halide with a variety of different nucleophiles in order to kick the X out and attach whatever the nucleophile is. So I can make turn one alkyl halide into another alkyl halide. That's what we see in that first line. I minus is attacking some other alkyl halide, displacing the X and replacing it with an I. So maybe we start with a, a Cl on the halogen. So we have an alkyl chloride and we react it with iodine and then on our product is an alkyl iodide. Or our nucleophile doesn't have to be a halogen. Our nucleophile could be a hydroxide like we've already seen in the last few slides. If a hydroxide reacts with an alkyl halide, then OH replaces X, 
And then on the other side, if I've added an OH group, a hydroxide group, to an alkane, what we call that product is an alcohol, right? Remember that when we have a, an, a hydroxyl group, an OH group, attached to some carbon-containing molecule, we call that an alcohol. If I have an OR, and remember R in this case is just some other carbon-containing group, if I, if I use an OR- as my nucleophile and I replace the X on the alkyl halide, I'll get an ROR, which is an ether. Or I can use uh, a, um, an SH- nucleophile and displace a halogen. That gives me a thiol. Or an SR- nucleophile, that gives me a thioether. Or an NH3, an amine, which gives me an amine salt, or an azide, or an alkyne, or a nitrile, or an ester, and so on and so on. What these nucleophiles have in common is that they have a pair of electrons that they can donate to the alkyl halide. So the nucleophile is always going to have a pair of reactive electrons, and the electrophile, the alkyl halide, is always going to have that polarized carbon that has a partial plus charge that's going to attract those reactive electrons, and it's going to cause the displacement, the, the replacement of the halogen atom. So we're going to look now a bit about what makes these electron pairs uh, reactive, more reactive or less reactive, because we want to be able to rank nucleophiles and their strength. We call that nucleophilicity. We want to know how strong the nucleophile is, and we want to know how strong the electrophile is. And the strength of the electrophile is based on the leaving group. If we have a good leaving group, then we would call that a strong electrophile. If we have a bad leaving group, then that would be a weak electrophile. And conversely, if we're looking at the nucleophile side of the reaction, when we have a strong nucleophile, that means we have a reactive pair of electrons. And if we have a weak nucleophile, that generally means we have an unreactive pair of, of electrons or a pair of electrons that's more stable. Remember, stability, if we have something that's stable, that's usually not reactive. Something that is reactive is usually a bit unstable. So we're going to be able to compare different nucleophiles to determine if they're better or worse. And we're also going to be able to compare different alkyl halides, different electrophiles, to determine if they're better or worse. So one thing that we have to uh, consider, we'll start from something that we've already looked at. We looked uh, about how bases react with acids. This was the, the nature of chapter two, remember? We looked at different bases and we looked at different acids. We looked at different pKa's so we could compare the strength of those acids. And remember what we said generally was that the strength of the acid was based on the conjugate base. So the more stable the conjugate base is, the stronger the acid is. So this is really when we're looking at basicity and nucleophilicity, they are very, very similar concepts. And so notice in the top here, we have a base that we're just gonna represent as B minus, and it has a pair of electrons. And so when that compound, whatever it is, we can just imagine it as being OH minus because hydroxide is something we're used to seeing as a base. If the OH minus, if it's attacking an H on another molecule, then we call it a base. If the OH minus, look at the bottom one now, if the OH minus is attacking something that's not an H, like a carbon, for example, in the substitution reaction we've been talking about, then we call it a nucleophile. Notice how it's OH- in both cases. OH- is considered a base if it attacks H. OH- is considered a nucleophile if it attacks carbon. So the nature of my base or nucleophile doesn't matter. That substance is not going to be classified as a base or a nucleophile just uh, because of the structure of, of the nucleophile or base itself. It's classified as a base or a nucleophile because of what it's attacking. So uh, in the top, we see a B minus attacking an acid, and that's going to make the A take its electrons with it. So let's just make this simple. We have OH minus, for example, and HCl. So the OH minus 
is going to attack the H on HCl. That's going to break the bond between the H and the Cl, and the Cl is going to take its electrons with it, and that gives us Cl- on the other side. So if we did that same thought experiment, and now we have OH- attacking HI, then the OH- is going to attack the H on HI, and the I is going to take the electrons between the H and the I with it and become I- on the other side. And we said HI is a stronger acid than HCl because the I- is more stable than the Cl-. Now, that's the exact same argument that we're making for nucleophilicity on the bottom, right? We're saying that when the OH- attacks the carbon in this case, it's not an H anymore, now it's a carbon, that's going to displace whatever our leaving group is, and it could be I again, so that now the, the base or the hydroxide is going to uh, make a bond between the carbon, and it's going to kick out the halogen, which would just become I- minus on the other side. So there are lots and lots of similarities between acids and bases and nucleophiles and electrophiles. It's a very subtle distinction. It is different, but it's very, very similar. So on the top, we would say that B is a base and HA is an acid. We would call it a Bronsted acid. So on the top, B- is a Bronsted base and HA is a Bronsted acid. In the bottom reaction, we can use the same terms. We can say B is a base and CX is an acid, but now we're going to call them Lewis bases and Lewis acids. So B- in the bottom is a Lewis base, and CX is a Lewis acid. They're still acids and bases. They're just not Bronsted acids and bases anymore. Now we would call them Lewis acids and bases. And a, a more specific term for that is nucleophile and electrophile. So B-, we would say, is a nucleophile, and CX, we would say, is an electrophile. But these are very similar reactions. So let's start looking at what makes a nucleophile strong or weak. So we've already mentioned this a bit, which is that when I have an alkyl halide, the carbon halogen bond is polarized. That means that the halogen side of it has a partial negative charge and the carbon side of it has a partial positive charge. So there's some electrostatic attraction that occurs between a nucleophile and an alkyl halide. If a nucleophile has a negative charge, like we see on top here, the CH3O-, we would call that methoxide. So this methoxide anion has a negative charge, and the carbon in this alkyl halide has a partial positive charge. It's not a full charge, it's not, it's not a plus, but it's a partial plus, that delta. So that, that allows for some electrostatic attraction. The methoxide is literally pulled toward that uh, substrate like a magnet because that's the same principle that magnets work on. Plus and minus are attracted to each other, right? So this methoxide is attracted to that C because it has a partial plus on it. That's going to make the methoxide a fairly strong nucleophile. They are literally pulled toward each other. Um, now let's contrast that with what we see on the bottom. On the bottom we have methanol. So methanol is just the conjugate acid of methoxide. In methoxide, the H is gone, and, it, and the O took the electrons, so it became O-. And if we look at the conjugate acid, we're just going to react methoxide with H+, which is going to give us methanol, which is what we see on the bottom, where we now have uh, the, the negative charge is gone, and instead we have an oxygen-hydrogen bond there. So one reason that we would say that methanol is a weaker nucleophile than methoxide is because of this electrostatic attraction. Now that oxygen does not have a, a full negative charge. It does have a partial negative charge because the carbon-oxygen bond is still polarized. The oxygen-hydrogen bond is still polarized. So that's going to give oxygen a partial minus charge, and that's still attracted to the partial plus charge on carbon, but now they're both partial charges. So that weakens the electrostatic attraction. It makes it not quite as strong. The other thing that we're going to see here in a minute 
is that there's a lot of H's on that carbon, right? Those H's make it difficult to access the carbon. The H atoms get in the way when the O tries to get close to the carbon to make a bond. Now the O also has an H on it. So the O, we can just say in general that methanol is bigger than methoxide. It's more difficult for a bigger molecule to get into that carbon to react. So for these two reasons, we say that a base is always a stronger nucleophile than its conjugate acid. One, the negative charge, and two, it's smaller. Uh, another factor we have to consider when looking at uh, nucleophilicity, what makes a nucleophile weak or strong, is electronegativity. And so this seems kind of counterintuitive at first, but it makes sense when you think about it a little bit. The more electronegative an atom is, the weaker nucleophile it is. And we've already talked about why that is a little bit, but let's bring it up again just so we can really hammer this point home. When something is stable it's not reactive. When something is unstable, it is reactive. So what does electronegativity do to an anion? The more electronegative an anion is, the more stable it is, right? One way of saying that is atoms that are electronegative like having a negative charge, which is to say they're more stable than other atoms that have a negative charge. That electronegativity is a measurement of how stable an atom is when it has a negative charge on it. So if an atom is electronegative, then it has, then it's stable when it has a negative charge. And if it's stable, then it's not as reactive. So if we see that here in the first sequence, we have N minus, O minus, and F minus. And if we look at their positions in the periodic table, it goes N, O, F. F is the most electronegative, O is a little bit less electronegative, N is the least electronegative. So when we're comparing the nucleophilicity of those three anions, we would say the nitrogen is the most nucleophilic because the nitrogen is the least stable. The F is the least nucleophilic because the F is the most stable. If an anion is stable, because it's so electronegative, then it doesn't have much of a reason to react. Particles react with each other so they can increase their stability. When we look at spontaneous reactions, they're, they're spontaneous because they become more stable. Nature wants on its own, nature tries to make things more stable. The ball always rolls downhill, it decreases its gravitational potential, Balls never roll uphill. They never get further away from the center of the earth all on their own because that's a less stable position for them. So uh, we can just say in general that the more electronegative an atom is, the less nucleophilic it is. So nitrogen is always going to be more nucleophilic than oxygen. Oxygen is always going to be more nucleophilic than fluorine. And if we go to another row in the periodic table, like between phosphorus and sulfur, we can say phosphorus is more electronegative than, or excuse me, phosphorus is more nucleophilic than sulfur because phosphorus is less electronegative than sulfur. So we already know the way that electronegativity increases on the periodic table up and to the right. So nucleophilicity kind of increases the other way, which is down and to the left. Another factor we have to look at when we're considering uh, whether a nucleophile is weak or strong is what we call nuclear is what we call polarizability. So we've talked about this a little bit, but here is a good graphic that shows why polarizability is important. So when something is polar, when something has a dipole moment, we say that the electrons, the charge is not shared equally, right? One side is is negative and the other side is positive because one side has more electrons and the other side has less electrons. So when something is polar, then those electrons are always uneven. They're always unequal. When something is polarizable, it's similar, which is to say that it's not necessarily that it's polar right now, but if it's polarizable, it is more easy to make that particle polar. 
So if we look at F minus, F is a small atom. Remember we said it's about as big as a hydrogen atom. It's pretty small. So F minus only has two shells of electrons. It has the inner shell, which just consists of the 1s orbital, and it has an outer shell, which consists of the 2s and the 2p orbitals. So there's only two electron shells on F, which makes it a fairly small ion. Because those electrons are so close to the nucleus, the second shell doesn't, the, it doesn't experience much shielding from the first shell, if we put it in Gen Chem terms. That means that the electrons in F are held very tightly to the nucleus. There's not a lot of electrons, so they can all feel the pull of the nucleus pretty strongly. That means that it's very hard to deform an F- ion. If we put a positive charge next to an F- and we keep the nucleus in place, and we bring a positive charge close to it, the electrons are going to reach out and try to grab that positive charge. They can't do that very well with F- because F- holds its electrons very, very tightly. It's not very polarizable. Now let's look at I-. I- has five shells of electrons, and so by the time we get to I-, minus, those electrons that are in the fifth shell, they have four shells of electrons underneath that are in the way, that are shielding them from the nucleus. So the electrons on the very outside of an atom don't feel the positive charge of the nucleus quite as strongly as the electrons that are on the inside because there's so many electrons in the way. So the fifth shell of electrons on I- minus is not held very tightly to the nucleus. That means if I bring a positive charge close to I-, minus, it can deform a lot easier. Those negative electrons are more likely to reach out and grab that positive charge because they're not being held very tightly to the nucleus because it's such a large ion and there are so many electrons underneath. So we would say I- minus is more polarizable. It is more easy to deform the electron cloud on I- minus than it is to deform the electron cloud on F-. minus. Now if we see the, the results of this, what that means is that as a nucleophile gets close to an electrophile, to the alkyl halide in this SN2 reaction, what has to happen is it has to get close to that C. Because remember, the nucleophile is trying to make a bond to the carbon, and that's going to kick out the leaving group, and the leaving group bond is going to break, and the leaving group will take its electrons with it. So notice what happens is that F- minus starts to get close to C. The electrons that are on the F- minus start to repel the electrons that are in the H atoms. See how that pushes them away. In the figure on the left, the geometry is tetrahedral. Those bond angles are 109.5 degrees. And as the F- minus moves closer to the carbon, it starts to repel the electrons in the H, and it pushes them away. So notice that in the transition state, all those Hs are standing up straight now, and now the bond angle is more like uh, trigonal bipyramidal, and so those bond angles are 120 degrees now between those hydrogen atoms because they're being repelled by the electrons on the F-. minus. And so there's an there's an anti-bonding orbital on that carbon that needs to overlap with the electrons in the F in order to make a new bond. The more overlap there is between the electrons in the F- and the empty orbital on carbon, the stronger the bond is going to be. Because F- is not very good at uh, deforming its electron cloud, because the electrons are held very tightly, we say it's not very polarizable, and it can't get very close to that carbon, that the electron cloud on F- minus doesn't get very close to that carbon in the transition state. Notice how it says little bonding. We don't have very much overlap there. But if we look at the I, iodine, the nucleus of the I, is about equidistant to the nucleus of the carbon as the F and the carbon. The little yellow dot on top versus how far away it is from the C in the transition state, and the little gray dot on the bottom versus how far away it is from the carbon, the nuclei are about equidistant in this case. The I is a little bit further away because the C-I bond is a little bit longer. But because the I 
can deform its electron cloud more because the electrons are, are easier to pull towards that positive charge, then it gets a lot more overlap between the electrons in the iodine and the antibonding orbital on the carbon there. So we say the I is more polarizable, and being more polarizable makes you a better nucleophile because it's easier to get those electrons in toward that carbon. In general, as the anion approaches the carbon, there's a lot of repulsion because, yes, the carbon is partial positive, and so there is some attraction, but there's also electrons on those H's that are repelling the electrons in the nucleophile. So as the more polarizable an ion is, the more it can deform its electron cloud and kind of reach out and grab that positive charge. So what we can say is that the bigger an ion is, the less tightly its electrons are held to the nucleus, the more polarizable it is, and the more nucleophilic it is. So larger, more polarizable ions are more nucleophilic than smaller, not polarizable ions.